Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode 9 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined this episode, as always, by my good friend Pervez Ahmed. And we know that this episode is a little bit late, but I think you'll agree that the delay was worth it. We have a fantastic guest, and uh, we're going to go ahead and play that. We actually had a conversation last week with Mustafa Davis. He is a celebrated photographer, filmmaker. He's also co-founder of Thought Leaf Collective, which is based in the Bay Area and also in Chicago, about uh, all manner of things. We talked about his American Muslim experience. We talked about how he came to Islam, what he's learned during his time as a Muslim, what he's learned during his time as an artist. And I think you'll agree that it was a fantastic conversation. So I'm just going to go ahead and cut right to the chat that we had last week with Mustafa Davis. So, Sidi Mustafa, thank you for joining us. We're honored to have you with us. We've been we've been uh, wanting to have you on for a while, so we're glad we could make it happen. It's a pleasure. Uh, so, so uh, the purpose of the show is really uh, the American Muslim experience, and I think you have a quintessentially American Muslim experience. <laughs> so, um, I was hoping you could just start things off by kind of telling us about uh, your journey to mm-hmm. Islam and maybe where you were at before you found Islam. Sure. Uh, how far back shall I go? How, as far back <laughs> as you feel comfortable. That's right. Uh, yeah. I'll go back, you know, because I think the upbringing has a lot to do with my choice to become Muslim. So I think it's it's important. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, my, my father's black American, my mother's uh, first generation German, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, I'm the only child that they had. My mother was married three times, and I'm the only one from from my father. So essentially, I am the Arnold or the Webster of my <laughs> of my family. For <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's different strokes, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a reference. I wonder how many in our listening audience will catch. Like, myself, we enjoy of no, but the host enjoys. So that's great. <laughs> uh, photos at my mom's house, you know. It's you know, and I was darker when I was younger too. I really I started to get a little that's bit lighter insane. when I was like 16, 17 years old. But I was I was dark, you know, big afro, and so it's like all these, you know. That's why I mentioned like her complexion, right? Like all my siblings, because mm-hmm. her other other marriages were also to white white men as well and so all my siblings are blonde hair and blue eyes Mm -hmm. and then there's me like in the in the photos uh and it's important because it it you know some of these things that i dealt with with identity issues Mm -hmm. growing up uh were part of the reason why i think i was kind of led to the path of 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 islam you know you know my parents when they got married they divorced when i was two but when they got married uh in in 71 uh we're not very far post civil rights Malcolm X Martin Luther King era and so my dad tells me stories of them trying to find apartments and going together and being denied right. and that's here in the bay area it, it was it was in right. mountain view and in, in santa clara and being denied right. and then my mother going the next day uh on her own uh, to a different apartment complex and then being accepted uh immediately right. and so there was still some racial tension oh, yeah. uh back then and there would be several places several states in the in the union where their marriage wouldn't have been, even been recognized exactly. even as late as 71 exactly yeah so so i grew up with 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 that you know they you know it was typical and then it's interesting that zaki said i had the quintessential american experience because uh, in my mind that triggers you just grew up in a broken home Mm-hmm. That's that to me. That's the quintessential mm-hmm. American experience, you know. So when you say that, that you know, I'm the quintessential American, then yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> a lot of my friends that grew up with the parents yeah, were divorced, right. you know, or they had they had issues uh, when they were growing up. Uh, to my f- to my folks' credit, uh, a lot of the issues that we dealt, and I'm saying this just sort of as a disclaimer because I'll probably I have a tendency to be quite candid about my experience, right. and so I'm saying this yeah. too, as a as a disclaimer. To their credit, they are you know having kids, you know. Post Vietnam, you know, California Bay Area hippie movement, you know, sex, love, drugs, and rock and roll, and so they were still trying to find themselves as, as well. And I can say that now, as a forty-one-year-old male, I wouldn't have said the same thing as a sixteen-year-old, you know, yeah. punk teenager, this rage against the machine, angry at your parents <laughs> uh, type thing. So they split at two. Uh, we moved to Sacramento with my mother. Uh, and I grew up in, in Sacramento. So you were born here in the I Bay. was born in the Bay Area, yeah. And I'm, I make sure to I, – I claim that as, That's much great. As, I, nice. <laughs> as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, I was born in the Bay, and then we moved to Sacramento gotcha. at two. Uh, not a religious family. Right. Uh, my father would consider himself an atheist. Mm. Uh, it's hard for me to say that because I don't believe in atheism. Mm. Uh, but at the time when I was a teenager, before I converted to Islam, I was also considered myself an atheist. I didn't believe in, in a higher power. Uh, my mother is uh, Catholic, uh, 
but I wouldn't say a practicing uh, Catholic when we were growing up. We went to church on some Sundays, mm. um, but then you know maybe there was a party at the house on Sunday night that you right. know completely <laughs> overrode everything right. that we did at church gotcha. that day. Um, my parents are still friends; uh, they're still close, so I didn't have that you know dad saying mom's horrible, mom saying dad's horrible. Uh, they're they're still close to this day. So early, early childhood, I dealt with issues of being sort of an outsider in my own home, mm. uh, never really feeling like I belonged to the family that I was that I was growing up in. Uh, and that's important because it I think I lashed out because of it, like a lot of American uh, kids do. Uh, and growing up in Sacramento, it's sort of like a farm town Man, of yes. sorts. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot to do. And so because of that, as a result, there's a lot of gang violence and a lot of a lot of crime. And so I never was in a gang, but I grew up in a gang, heavy gang area in Lincoln Village, California, in Rancho Cordova, in Sacramento, Lincoln Village. Um, friends, my all my friends were in gangs, uh, but I, I wasn't. I always, you know, I tell people now, I was sort of like, I forget his name in the film too. I think his name was Trey in, in Boys in the Hood, mm -hmm. where I had a dad who was like, you know, he has a double degree, he was, mm -hmm. you know, professional uh, very articulate, uh, and always emphasized education, right. education, Lawrence just Fishburne's stay character. Out of, Lawrence Fishburne's yeah, character. Yeah, yeah. Stay out of trouble. Right. Very, very similar. Same things when I wanted to go in the military, military yeah. is not a place for a young black man. He's a Vietnam vet, you know, and so he's like, military yeah, yeah. is not a place for a young black man. Um, and so I had that sort of whatever troubles I went through in my childhood, I always had sort of this hero figure that I would visit once a month that kind of kept me, yes. kept me, kept me in line. Um, and so, when I was going through the issues, the identity issues that I was going through in Sacramento, uh, I always wanted to be someone different. Uh, and that's really just honest. You know, I just, I wanted to be someone other than I was even my name. Like, like when you convert to Islam and they say, it's, you know, you got to change your name for me, it was like, awesome. Give me the list. Let me choose. Right. It wasn't like this forceful thing for me. And part of it is because <laughs> where I grew up, uh, the star, high school quarterback of a of a rival school rancho cordova high school his name was brian davis and so i was like the less cool brian davis <laughs> <laughs> growing up <laughs> and so so when they told me you can change your name yeah. i was like Halas, that's it that's it i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna change my name so typical you know fast forward typical you know quintessential american upbringing mm. uh issues with you know authority mm. Uh, I did really well in elementary school, straight A's, junior high school, straight A's, high school, freshman year, C's, sophomore year, D's, junior year, straight F's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can see where that right. where that, that went. And a lot of that was just, again, the crowd that I was running with. Uh, and then getting mixed up with alcohol and, and drugs and things like that kind of led me off, off the path. And so... That's sort of where I was uh, up until 16 when I moved back to, to San Jose. So you were still in high school? I was still in high school when I moved back, yeah. And I didn't actually move back. I was kicked out. I got kicked out of high school, and it was the third high school that I got kicked out of. Right. And mom was like, that's it. You know, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. You got to go back to your dad's. And so then I came back to, to San Jose and finished mm -hmm. high school here in, in East San Jose at Yerba Buena High School. Mm -hmm. Wow. So then uh, that brings us, I mean, you and I then probably graduated around the same time. We're talking then early to mid-90s. Early, early 90s. 90s. 91, I graduated. 91, you graduated. I graduated in 92. Well, let's be honest. Yeah. 91, I was supposed to graduate. Oh, okay, yeah. I graduated the summer uh, after. I didn't walk. Oh, yeah. basically. I graduated, graduated that yeah, summer. Yeah, yeah. I had to make up some, yeah, yeah, yeah. some credits. <laughs> okay. That's legit. Um, so that's San Jose. And then um, now, then I think, and, and some of this will overlap, interestingly enough, with some of the stories or the background that we talked about with, with Osama, because mm. now you, you guys meet in college. We meet in college, yeah. Right. So now you're at, what, De Anza? Or is that I was at... I was at De Anza. Okay. Actually, before I yeah, met, yeah, like, and this is a, this is important in the story. Before right, before the, I met the flea market or be, whatever, right? That, yeah, is that the story. Actually, even before that, before gotcha. I met Usama, I was living here with my with my father, mm -hmm. and uh, like I said, he's a professional entrepreneur, doing very well, uh, and he decided to to leave the job that he was at to do some of his own to follow his own passion. Right, uh, and so he had a rough like three four year period there. Uh, lost his job. I mean, he quit his job and then tried to do his own thing, lost a lot of money in, in, in some business endeavors. And uh, my stepmother at the time, uh, throughout that 
process, uh, they split. Mm. Mm. Uh, and so he, he kind of was down and out in that, in that phase, uh, lost his house. Uh, and this is when I was living with him. Car was repossessed. And then we went through uh, several months of kind of sleeping on friends' couches, kind of like surfing, couch surfing on, mm. on people's couches. Uh, and you know, my father's a man, he's, a, he's, he has a lot of pride. He's a very honorable man. And so he doesn't like to put people out. Mm. And so we ended up staying in some weird sort of in, in, in South San Jose, some strange, like halfway house type place. Mm. Uh, and I remember it vividly. I was 18 at this time. This is post-graduation, yeah. post-high school. Yeah. Uh, I was 18 and we were living in this cockroach infested place and it was just we heard people coming in and out strange. Uh, and then we couldn't even afford that after a while. That was like something like $20 a night or something like, like that. Maybe the suburban, the suburban equivalent of like, like, like a project or something. It's basically, like, yeah. But it's in the middle of the suburbs, gotcha. like literally right. in the middle of the suburbs. Right. It was just this one kind of Interesting. dilapidated house that wow. was there. Uh, and you know, we were, and I remember it vividly yeah. we were eating rich crackers and peanut butter. That's what we were living on, right. you know? Um, and then one night we were sleeping and, and, uh, he heard like rats mm. on the floor and he was like, that, that's, okay. that's it. That's mm. it. Let's go. And so we left that night, uh, and we slept in the park. We slept in the park. And I remember it very, very vividly because it, it has a profound influence on who I am right. today. This, 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 this one experience. It was one night being homeless. Basically. Uh, we slept in the park. We, we sat down on the park bench and he said, we're just going to stay here tonight. Uh, tomorrow we'll figure out what we're going to do. He said, but we're not going to submit to this. This isn't going to be who we are. And so he instructed me to, to, to not sleep laying down. He said, sit up, don't, don't sleep laying down. Don't like, basically don't give in. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> so I woke up with the sun beating down on my face, like flat on the bench <laughs> and he wasn't anywhere around. And I didn't know what I should do. Should I wait for him? Because this time there was no car either. The cars had gotten repossessed. Should I wait for him? Should I, you know, what do I do? So I just sat there and about an hour later he comes and he goes, okay, let's go. Right. It's okay. And so we're all the way out Blossom Hill, San Jose, cool. right out, out yeah, that yeah, area, yeah. South San Jose. Right. And he goes, let's walk. And so we walked, we walked the entire day to downtown San Jose. Wow. The entire day. We walked across the entire San Jose, San Jose, got to downtown San Jose, went to the Greyhound station. Mm -hmm. He had found, got some money and he said, I, I can't, I've been poor in my life in my life before, mm -hmm. uh, but I can't do this with you. I can't make you go through this cause I'm not, I don't have it together. Right. And so, so I'm going to put you on a bus back to, to back to Sacramento, to your mom's huh. until I can get back on my feet and then I'll bring you back. Mm -hmm. Right. And I went, you know, kicking and screaming. I did not want to go back to my mom's cause I had a, an estranged relationship with my stepfather. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the reasons why I got kicked out, it, it came to blows and they called the cops on me and I was trying to stab him with a knife. And, and as, as vivid as that is, I think it's important people to understand that people don't just convert to Islam from like these posh backgrounds and everything was great. And then I made this choice, you know, yeah. some of us come from very troubled, troubled backgrounds. So I got on the Greyhound, went to my mom's. Uh, I didn't realize that he hadn't called her oh, to right. arrange it. Yeah, right. So I walk from downtown Sacramento to where my mom lives in Rancho Cordova, which is about, you know, like a five hour, five hour walk. And I get there and I knock on her door and she opens up the door and she's looking at me. And I said, dad sent me back. And she just said, no, she said, no, you can't wow. stay here. Wow. And I was like, well, where do I go? And my sister at the time, my older sister is five years older than me at the time, lived on the next block over. She said, go to your sister. She'll take you in. So wow. I said, okay. I went to my sister's, huh. uh, walked to my sister's and she said, you can stay here for a week. And the reason that they were being this way, to be fair to them, yeah, yeah. I caused yeah, a yeah. lot of trouble. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Literally like if, me as a father now, I, I don't blame them. Right. Huh. You know, I caused a lot, a lot of trouble for my, for my family as a, as a teenager. So I can totally feel my mother now saying like, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't be here. Cause that's, I'm an adult now. I'm 18 years old. So huh. I go to my sister said, you can stay a week. And she said, but you got to find a job. I said, okay, I'll, 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 I'll get a job. Mm -hmm. So I literally every day went out when I know car. So I'm walking, trying to find jobs, Taco Bell, McDonald's, wherever. Yeah. And, uh, couldn't find one. And I really, and I've said before, like I've tried this time. I legitimately, legitimately was trying and I couldn't, I couldn't find a job. Uh, and so I don't remember what day of the week it was, but it was a week at this point. And right. she said, she said, you got to find a job. If you don't have a job today, you can't come back. You, you can't come back. Cause her, her husband at the time, he was also fed up with the things I had done, uh, be, before I left. Mm -hmm. And if I was able to tell you what I'd done, you would totally be on their side. And trust me, <laughs> no, 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 I'm not trust right. me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I went out that day in the morning, early looking, couldn't find it. Uh, and I knew I 
just at some point I just knew I wasn't going to get a job and I knew they were serious. And, mm-hmm. and, and that night in the park, I didn't want to do that again. So I was like, I, I, I got to do something. So I called old friends from Sacramento that I grew up with. Same thing. Yeah, dude. Sorry. They didn't want anything to do with me either. Yeah, dude. Sorry. Can't, can't do it. Uh, and this is important. I've told this story before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think at that point when I came back to her house, it was like three or four in the afternoon. I knew they were coming home at like six. Mm. And I just said to myself, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do this anymore. No one wants me. Mm -hmm. Can't don't belong anywhere. I can't please anybody. I can't keep consistent. Can't keep a job. I can't keep off drugs. Uh, I'm just going to end it. And so, uh, my sister's husband uh, the way they met is that he had actually fallen in an elevator. I don't remember how many floors and injured his back. And she was working at a chiropractor office. And so they met at that time. Mm-hmm. But I knew he had muscle relaxants in the house. And I knew that if you were going to take pills, because we had suicidal tendencies in my household growing up. Uh, and so I knew if you're going to do it, this is the way to do it. You know, it'll be quick. Mm-hmm. You know, your heart will go into cardiac mm-hmm. arrest. You won't right. feel anything. It'll be done. So I took a bottle of his muscle relaxants and an entire bottle of, of Tylenol. Uh, and I was serious. I, uh, I vomited it up and I was worried that if I vomited it up, I vomited up the poison. So I took another bottle of Tylenol. So it was, it, eventually it was like two bottles of Tylenol and a bottle of, of, of muscle relaxants. Um, and I remember just laying down on the kitchen floor and yeah. just waiting, you know, just didn't know what was going to happen, right. but I didn't believe in a higher power. So it wasn't important to me really what happened, just that it was, that it was over. Yeah. And I remember everything at that point, just going in slow motion, like mm-hmm. the ceiling. Yeah. I remember the ceiling would, would feel like it was like floating close and then floating far and then just slow motion. Mm-hmm. Um, miraculously from God, my sister came home early that day. She was worried that I wasn't going to find a job mm-hmm. and she wanted to like sort things out before the husband, before uh-huh. her husband came home. Yeah. And she, she found me, uh, unconscious on the kitchen floor in the pool of my own vomit. And, uh, she immediately like started slapping me and I wasn't gone yet. So I, w- yeah. I woke up, but I don't remember it. I just right. remember this in flashes. Now she called my mother. I remember they filled the bathtub with ice cubes and cold water, put me in there. They wouldn't let me fall asleep. They kept trying to make me vomit. Um, fast forward, rushed me to the hospital. Uh, in my mind, this all took place literally within seconds of each other. Like even in my recollection of the memory, mm. I don't remember the drive to the hospital. I don't remember any of that. Uh, I remember now after talking to them afterwards, they rushed me in over someone who had a gunshot wound. That's how serious it was. They said that they said I was literally a few minutes away from complete cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they, they, they put a tube up my nose down to my throat, put the charcoal in, put my stomach. Um, and, uh, I didn't want them to help me. Like I literally, I gave one of the nurses, a male nurse, <laughs> a black eye. Not that that's any better than yeah. if it was a female <laughs> nurse, but, but I gave him a black eye cause I was literally fighting them off. I didn't want them to help me. They strapped mm-hmm. me down. They eventually strapped me down and they, and they did it. And then I remember the next memory I had, I woke up uh, in the ICU with all these tubes in my nose, still these button, all these monitors on my heart monitors on my body. I remember my first thought, I looked over in the corner room and saw my mom, she was in the corner crying. And my first thought was, damn didn't work. Mm, wow. And so I was just thinking, how am I going to get out of here with these super under the supervision to go make it work hmm. under California state law. If you attempt suicide, you have mandatory three months in a mental institution. So really? they sent me, yeah, they sent me to Sutter Memorial mental institution, uh, in, Sac- in, Sac- in Sacramento on yeah. Folsom Boulevard. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they put me in there. I escaped the first night. Uh, I figured out, they let you go in the patio and I saw that there was like a trellis there and things. So I said, I can hop that fence. I hopped it and ran, uh, got picked up like 15 minutes later by the cops and brought back. And then that was a different experience. Cause now I got back back and then I'm now maximum security there because I'm an escape mm. risk. And so I actually was for, for about a week in a white padded room, which was, which was really, really, uh, interesting. But this is important because I think, Although I didn't know about Islam right. at this time when I was in a mental institution, uh, I made the decision to commit to God there. Okay. I, I made a conscious decision. And part of it was because the first night I was there after I got brought back, uh, they have meds that you have to, that you have to take. And so mm-hmm. they gave me some meds and I took them and I had been done drugs in my life yeah. and I was high. Like they gave me these meds and it was like LSD type stuff. And mm-hmm. I, I wasn't, I wasn't cognizant. I couldn't think I couldn't. And so, uh, I told myself, I'm not going to take them anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to take these meds anymore. And so I learned how to tongue it right. So that I could hide it from them so that they couldn't see. 
Uh, but then the next day when I was there for the whole day, I saw troubled people. And I realized that I didn't have real problems. Mm -hmm. I was just a bitter kid. Like twice. Yeah. yeah, I was just, you know, I had problems, but not like, like I could control my problems. Mm -hmm. They were in a situation they couldn't control. And one of the first images I saw when I left the room as a kid was banging his head on the on the on the wall hard and I could hear it and then I saw like the orderlies come and rush and pull him away and there was literally blood stains on the wall that's how hard he was hitting his head a girl would pull her fingernails off like and so she had like all these gauze and stuff on her fingers people talking to themselves down down the hall and I realized I'm not like them right right I might have some emotional issues that I'm dealing with but I'm not like them and since I'm not like them I don't belong here okay. and that's what I, and so I had a nurse I remember his name to this day his name was Randy he was an African American brother named Randy and he came and he would take my blood and like take my vitals and stuff. And like the third day after talking to him, he just looked at me and he goes, what are you doing here? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, why are you here? And I said, oh, because I attempted this. He goes, no, I know what you did. I know what you did. And I know that, but why are you here? Mm. What, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't get what you mean. He goes, you don't belong here. Hmm. And I said, I don't understand what you mean. He said, he said, you're fine. You, you have some issues that you're dealing with, but you're not like these people. You get yourself together and get out of here. And I said, I want to. I've tried to get my life together, this and that. And then he said, he said, you know why I do what I do? And I said, why? He said, because I used to be in here. And I said, you did? He said, yeah. You know why? And I said, why? He said, attempted suicide. And he said, I made the decision when I was in here that I was going to change. Mm. And I changed and I came back and I purposely got a job here so I could help people like you. Wow. And that was it for huh. me. That was it. I was like, at that point, I was like, he did it. He was like me. He changed. I'm going to change. And he was religious. He was Christian, but he was religious. And I, so I attributed that to religion gets you better. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I'm going to be religious. And so I had conversations with God there for the first time. I said, if you get me out of here and you help me get out of here, I'll dedicate my life to serving people through you. And that was it. Right. And then, so, so up until that time you had, I mean, consciously identified as someone who, like you said, don't, didn't believe in I didn't believe power. in God. And I, no, I didn't believe in a higher power right. at all to the extent so, that I used to try to find people that were religious yeah. and convince them that God didn't exist. Like right. I was literally a human devil and I, like, like Malcolm calls himself that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I literally would go and try to find the most religious people and try to convince them that religion didn't exist, that it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. And if, and if I saw, if I saw that I was making sense to them or I was, I, I was happy. Like that's why I call I literally a human devil. I was really, really my purpose. I would try to knock people off their, off their religion. Mm -hmm. And huh. so this moment for me was a pivotal moment for mm -hmm. me because I used to refuse to call on God if I was in trouble. I wouldn't do it because I, you know, I was trying to follow my father's yeah. footsteps. He's an intelligent man. Obviously he's done the research. I don't have to do it. God doesn't exist. So therefore, but here when I'm at the bottom of the barrel, right. there's no far, you can't get any lower than this. At that point, I was stripped of everything, ego, pride. Every, I'm in a white padded room. You can't have right. ego in a white padded room. Yeah. And I, everything was stripped away, and the only thing that was left was God. Mm. And I realized that. That's the only thing that was left. And so then I started to think, why would I call on him? Why would I feel this if he didn't exist, if it wasn't in me already? Right. right? And so uh, three months mandatory, I got out in two weeks. I was able to convince them. Uh, this is why I have a problem with, with, with psychologists and psychiatry now. Uh, I was able to convince them that I didn't really want to com kill myself yeah. and that I was just trying to show my family that I wanted help right. and that I knew my sister was coming home early and I timed it perfectly to when she was going to come in and I wasn't really unconscious when right, she walked right, in. Right. And they believed it and they bought it and I got out. I got out in two weeks. Hmm. Um, and after I made that commitment. Now, it wasn't all, you know puppy dogs and sunshine from, After from, that. from that point forward, right. you know, I had a lot of people that I had hurt, you know, in my life and, you right. know, a lot of people that I had to kind of make amends with, but I stayed in Sacramento. I got a job and I stayed in Sacramento for about another month or so. And then I moved back to San Jose and then I started going to college. I went to De Anza college. Okay. Uh, and about, you know, literally about six months after that experience is when I met Osama Kennan. But then things had gotten better with your dad. Were you living with your dad again, or I didn't? I oh, came yeah. back and I and I and I got a job, okay. and I was living in downtown San Jose, and and I was going to school during the day, and I was working at a restaurant in the evenings. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now you and Osama's paths cross. And then Osama and I, right. then our paths cross. Right. Yeah. And is, is Yahya Rodas there too? Yahya isn't here. Oh, okay. Yahya's in, in in San Diego. Oh, that's going right. To school at San Diego yeah. State at the time. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So then, uh, okay. And then, so then you're, you're, you're in college. Um, by now you have, 
you said you've, you've reckon you, you know, you believe in a higher power. Yeah. You're, you're sort of, you know, uh, searching internally. Mm -hmm. Your, your searches take you where? Oh, I got my act together and they take me back to the church. And they take you. So yeah, that was yeah. the starting point. That was like the starting my point. My mom's religion. Yeah. That's what I knew growing yeah. up, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so I went back to the church. It didn't work because I, I had issues with, with the creed. I had issues with, 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 with Christian theology. Uh, was it Trinitarian, like the, Trinitarianism or yeah, something else? Yeah, no, it was, it was Catholicism. Yeah. So they had the Trinity yeah, yeah. and I, and it confused me. Okay. And I, and I asked so many different priests, you know, can you help explain this to me? And I found that none of them could. Mm -hmm. And that it was always just, you have to have faith. And that this is what religion is. And if you can't have faith, then you don't really believe in God. And I was like, well, I kept thinking that God wouldn't make it that confusing. Mm -hmm. Like he would, he would give me, you know, something, you know, to, to, to go on. Uh, so I left the church uh, literally after a year or so. You know, and I tried different denominations, going to different different places. And one thing that really got me was every church I went to was like the church for that nationality. Mm. I even went to a Korean church at oh, one yeah. point, right. right? Black Baptist church, right? I went to a Presbyterian church, right. different uh, uh, Catholic churches. But it was always like the Filipino Catholic church or the Chinese Catholic church or the Black Baptist church. And, and in my mind, I didn't feel that God would compartmentalize his followers. Mm. Like I, I wanted something that was more unifying something that I was looking for the United colors of Benetton of religion. That's, that's. <laughs> well, so I, a little confessional. So like, yeah. I, I mean, I've driven by these type of churches yeah. all my life, uh, never gone in. So when, 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 when it says like, you know, Korean or, mm. or black or whatever, you're, you're, is it like hundred percent of hundred percent of the, of the, of the, of the uh, what do you call them? The, uh, the, the congregation, the congregation is, uh, uh to the, for like the most a very part, high percentage, a, a high percentage, I would say 80 plus. Gotcha. Right. 80% plus. So others are welcome, but you're welcome. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's God's, yeah, 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 it's yeah. God's place. Right? right. It's a welcome, but culturally gotcha. you, you're not going to really, have to yeah, struggle to, you're going to have to struggle to make yourself yeah. right. And you're going to have to struggle to see, you know, yourself as a part of this group, you know? And a lot of people, so it, like like a, as a Korean church, would would the sermon arguably be in like Korean? No, it would be in English. Oh, okay, it, okay, okay. I think they have some that are. Oh, I just never, I never, I never, I never went to those. You know, uh, but you know, uh, I think you won't. You probably won't find very many people that would admit this. Mm. But I think, and then this is just my personal opinion, that a lot of people who are looking for religion, a lot of times they're just looking for community. Uh, and it's, it's not necessarily like a, a theological, right. uh, process that's happening in the brain. And I, d I don't think that's a necessary process because now as a Muslim, I really truly believe that the, my entire life, God was always with me, <laughs> whether I felt it or not, or whether I decided to recognize it yeah, or not. Right. Uh, and so I didn't need to find God, right? I needed to find people that helped remind me of God. Right. That helped mm. remind me on a constant basis that God is there. People that could help guide me. But I wasn't necessarily, I don't think I was necessarily looking for God uh, in that sense. Uh, and then, you know, this is all, you know, in the 90s still, you know, yeah. mid 90s, early 90s, actually. And, and this is right after Spike Lee's Malcolm X film came okay. out, you know. And as someone of mixed heritage, you know, you, it's something I think that's kind of ingrained in us. We don't like to conform. Uh, and that's partly, I think, because just even, you know, just with our racial makeup, yeah. you're never fully black, right. right? You'll be around the black, but they'll talk about white people and you're like, but that's my mom. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be around your white friends and they'll talk about black people. And you're like, but that's my dad. So you never really felt like you fit 100%, uh, with, with them. Uh, so the reason I mentioned the Malcolm X film is that I did meet some Muslims in school. Uh, cause when I met Osama, he wasn't a Muslim. Right. But I did meet some Muslims in school, and I remember thinking to myself, uh, yeah, I'm not going to do that whole Spike Lee thing. And I remember saying that. I don't remember who I said that to. And by that you meant? I meant the Malcolm X. Like, it's the, everyone's wearing X hats uh, now. It's right. cross colors are in. It's yeah. cool to be. And back to you know, Africa's in. Back to Africa, you know, yeah. rage against the machine, you know, kind of Pan-Africanism going pan on. Pan-Africanism going on. Uh, and I just didn't want to do that, you know. Just because everyone else was doing it. And it might have been the thing. I might have actually wanted to do it, but I wasn't going to do it because everyone else was going to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is the age, like black people then at that time, assalamu alaikum, alaikum yeah, assalam, yeah, yeah. whether you're Muslim or not. It was right. like the cool thing, cool thing to do. Everyone's wearing Africa medallions. You know, oh, yeah. I, I did the whole Kwame high top fade with Africa <laughs> bleached into the front of my, <laughs> in the front of my yep. fade, you know. Take me back to high school. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't want to do it. So when I actually did meet Usama, yeah. We were in Spanish class together, uh, 
And <laughs> that's where we yeah, met. Ironically, or interestingly enough. Interestingly enough, we met, we met in Spanish class. Yeah. Uh, even more interesting than that, I think we spent two days in class and then we just skipped every other class <laughs> after that. And we would just sit out in the quad and, right. and, and talk. And we realized that we had some mutual friends, although I was older, but we had some mutual mutual friends. And so we would talk. So you guys hit it off pretty quick. Very quickly, yeah. And I think it's sort of like a mulatto thing, yeah, like a mixed heritage because thing. because of his background. Yeah, yeah because, the, you know, you always can, like, uh, you can, I can always tell when someone's mixed, like black and white. Mm. And it's just mm. something that you, you, you know, like Egyptians can tell another Egyptian, yeah, yeah. Pakistanis can tell another Pakistani. And mm. so I, well, I always yeah. knew. So we saw each other. And although Osama's light complexion and he has straight hair, I knew immediately that he was, that he was mm. black. And so we would just kind of talk about our lives and our upbringing and our, you know, we both were into reggae at the time and into some not so positive extracurricular activities that we would do together. Uh, and and I remember one day, I don't remember what it was that happened, but uh, I remember I said when I left Sacramento and I left the mental institution, it wasn't just, you know, night and day, everything's fixed, you know. Mm. And so I was still doing drugs and drinking and things at, at, at the still time. Still struggling and with your demons. As yeah, well. and, you know, but I'm still trying to get my act together. I'm mm. living on my own, paying my rent, you know, going to school. Right. And I remember just one day I said, you know, I don't want to do this. I want to get better. I don't want to just skate by. I want to I want to live an excellent life. I don't want to just yeah. live. Because already, you know? I mean, arguably, I mean, there's been improvement. Yeah, yeah, right? vast I mean, improvement. Right, of course. I mean, that's amazing. Of, but... The fact that you still have that inner voice saying that, that, I think that's beautiful because oftentimes people will accept a life of mediocrity. Well, the interesting thing is... Or a life of, you know what I mean? Of, I think of, of, a majority of us probably, probably do. Of, we get into, yeah. the, into a mundane lifestyle, right. just kind of, you know, wake up, do this and that's the same right. thing and, and do it on repeat. Uh, the, the, I attribute this to my father because he's an entrepreneur and he was always striving, always doing something new, always reading, always getting, always trying to make himself better. And I, and I don't, the, the interesting thing is that there wasn't anything significant that happened in my life. Mm-hmm. I think I was just home one night thinking like, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't want to live in a one bedroom, you know, place downtown San Jose with a shared bathroom. I don't want to do this, you know, into my, you know, my, my twenties and my, my thirties. I want to do something. I want to live an excellent life. And so, uh, Usama and I, we used to have very candid conversations just about life, uh, in general. And so I went to him one day, we went, we went to Miyake Sushi, which was across from De Anza College in Cupertino. We actually tried to drive by there a year ago, and it was gone. We were really sad. Oh. Uh, this is Lucky's hangout, right? <laughs> or you, you haven't been at Danza in a while. But. No, I teach oh, there. Yeah, 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 that's right. I teach there yeah. every summer. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we were there, we were out there, uh, you know, and we went to sushi. Usama was a vegan at the at the time, and he was always trying to get me to be a be a vegan. Uh, and yeah, sorry, I didn't know that. He, that he had... You know, it gives me a hard time. So no, no, he was a hardcore, hardcore <laughs> vegan. You can bring that up. To yeah, I will. <laughs> I'm going to use that against him. Yeah, he was a, he was a hardcore, hardcore vegan. Any okay. weapons you need against the Let me know. I know I'm the man to ask. More right. than willing to give them to you. Uh, but I told him, I yeah. said, I'm going to change, man. Right. I'm tired of this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the church. Wow. And he was there and he put his head down and he goes, you know, you should look into Islam. And my answer to him, I remember it. I said to him verbatim, I said to him, no, thanks, man. Uh, that's a religion for, for black separatists and mm-hmm. Arab terrorists. Wow. And that was my response to him. So, so we're talking here mid nineties, 90, yeah. 96. Yeah. This is 96, 96. 96. This is February 96 right, in Ramadan. Take shot. I mean, yeah. I'm not, I'm not giving away the punchline, but you, you take yeah. shot. In yeah, we sort of know. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what I'm saying. I'm not giving away <laughs> the twist. Of the, the twist ending. ending. <laughs> right. The, the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So early ninety six. Early ninety six. Gotcha. So, so your exposure to Islam is basically, you know, the, up in this the point, first the nation and, and, and the hijacking, right. and just you know, kind of the, well closer to home, the nation. Yeah, yeah. The, my my experience of Islam at that time was okay. really nation of Islam. Okay. okay. Like Islam was a black, black thing, black, yeah. black, black thing, thing, and then it was a black thing. Crazy yeah. people overseas, and then you hear yeah. about, yeah. and then so the crazy people overseas. It wasn't what we know now. It right. was just from films I grew up watching, oh, and you, Back to the Future it was yeah, Libyans, yeah. right, <laughs> with plutonium and AK forty seven, and that's what I thought of Islam because again, Delta Force, Delta. Of course, exactly because I'm watching these movies, yeah. right? And so, you know, and so is everyone else, and so is everyone else. And so, you're not doing your own research, you're that's thinking, right. like, oh, that's what they are, okay, that's nor what is it are. as ubiquitous in the media as it is now. I mean, let's exactly. Be real. So, it was like you said, you almost have to go back to like these little, uh, you know, lamppost in popular culture. Well, you know, you know just of course, the, to, the World Trade Center bombing had happened, but right, I mean, I felt like if you weren't like even in the news, if you weren't like a news watcher, or whatever, it wasn't like it was as now that wasn't even was, something on it my wasn't because it wasn't like something like 9 11 where it was just you know. Huge not moment. Not, not, not at all. Yeah. And, you know, just maybe just a quick tangent. Mm-hmm. You know, now post-Islam, 
you know, here we are, 2014, you know, all eyes on the Muslims type thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, th- I won't be popular for saying this, but I get it. The negative views about Muslims, I get it. Because I felt that way about Russians. And when I was growing up in the 80s, 80s. and I had never met a Russian. There you go. You know, Reds. but they were communist. And well, you saw Rocky IV. I saw Rocky IV. <laughs> right. exactly. That's, all That's all I needed. They were bad, right? Rocky IV told me, you know, Ivan Drago was the bad guy. And he was so bad, he had to use drugs and steroids yeah, yeah, to win. Right. But Rocky's right. doing it naturally. Oh, natural. Right. The American. Climbs the mountain. Climbs the mountain while the guy's on the... The first the CrossFitter. Yeah, he was, like the, he was CrossFit before CrossFit. Yeah. So as a, as a yeah. young kid, I had that view yeah. because mm-hmm. I, never did my, I never did my own research. Right. But the media told me that this is what it was. And I bought it hook, line, and sinker, you know? Right. So after I told him that I didn't want to, didn't want to become Muslim, he said, well, you should look into it. Oh, they, sorry. Quick question. Yeah. Now, you know his brother at this point? Because I then, don't. Because when we were talking about Osama, I, I, we were know, Osama I know, I know, I know of his, his brother. Background. I know of his brother, but I didn't yeah. meet Anas until after I converted. Gotcha. Yeah, sorry. But I, okay. but I know him. Right, right. I know of him because okay. it would be through, through Osama. Mm-hmm. And so, and this is actually when Osama brings him up uh, in a, in a, you know, in a, in a direct manner yeah. in, in, terms of, in regards to Islam. Right. He says, you know, the Muslims, they have a prophet uh, that they follow whose name is Muhammad. Uh, peace be upon him. And he's not Muslim. Osama's not Muslim at the time. Hmm. Uh, he says his name is Muhammad. And uh, he's the son of Ishmael, the son of Abraham. He said they have the same prophets that Christians have. And I was intrigued now, you know. And I said, hmm, th- that's interesting. Because, you know, my brother's a Muslim. He said, I'm not a Muslim, but my Man. brother's a Muslim. I was like, okay, interesting, cool. I don't remember the rest of the conversation. This was on a Wednesday. Uh, that evening, I went to Barnes & Noble Bookstore on Stephen Creek's Bo- Stephen's Creek Boulevard, Stephen Creek and San Tomas, yes. and I went to go find a Bible, uh, and and because that, that's what I was going to do. I was going to get back to religion, and on my way to the Christianity section, I was- walked past the Eastern philosophy section, and I looked up for, for some reason, and I saw uh, Martin Ling's book, uh, Muhammad, His Life Based on the Earlier Sources, mm-hmm. and it was written on the side, on the, on the spine of the book, Muhammad in gold letters. And it triggered Osama told me about this guy, Muhammad. Uh-huh. And so I pulled the book down and I opened it up and I tried to read it. Now, like every third or fourth word is an Arabic name, Abdul Mutallab, Abu Qasim. I could, I, yeah. I could, and so I was reading it. And, but it's interesting because yeah. as I was reading it, I was like, see, it's a, a religion for Arabs. I can't even pronounce the words that they're right. Uh-huh. And so I put it back. But what stuck in my head is that through that short, uh, reading that I was doing, I read about a page. Uh, it made reference to the Quran three or four times. Now I didn't know what the Quran was and th- you might laugh at me for this because the Quran for me was K O R A N. Mm-hmm. I didn't know about a Q U R A N. Oh, so you saw it on the books. I saw, <laughs> I saw I this Q thing. I didn't know the, this Q thing, but I saw it now the Q, the Q Quran in Martin Ling's book. Right. Mm. Right. And so I put it back. Oh, I put right. the book back, but yeah. when I put it back right next to it is Yusuf Ali's translations of the, of the Quran. It's spelled with a Q. Right? It's spelled with a Q. <laughs> That's so right. I pick it up. And I read it. True story. I kid you not. This is a true story. I opened up to a random page, which just so happened to be the very first page of Surat Al-Mariam. I read it from uh, start to finish. <clears throat> I'm in the bookstore. By the end of reading it, I was in tears. Because it answered the questions I had about Christianity mm-hmm. that no Christian priest could answer. And here I pick up this random book, you know, and then literally within one chapter... It gave me the answers of what, who was Jesus, right? And as a Christian, that's important because, you know, if you don't accept Jesus, that's it, eternal damnation. Yeah. And so now here's this version of Jesus that makes sense to me. Yeah. That makes sense. He wasn't God's son. He was a prophet like all the other prophets. And I started to think, why would God kill his son to save people when God's omnipotent? He could just save you if he wanted to. I bought it. I bought the crop. I took it home. I read that chapter two more times that night, and I refused to read anything else. I was afraid if I read something else, I would read something that I didn't believe in. Right. And I just wanted, if you would have told me that Islam was sort of Maryam, I would have taken it <laughs> at that point. I would have um, taken it. But I was afraid if I kept reading, it would have been some weird thing that I couldn't get with. And then here I would be lost again and, and not really have a, a, a religion. That was Wednesday night when I bought it and took it home and, and, and read it. And then Thursday I went to school uh, and Osama didn't have class on Thursdays, so I didn't. I wanted to tell him, like I, you know, I got this book and I read the Quran, and but he didn't have class on Thursdays. When I went there, I met uh, a man by the name of Khadim, um, and Thank you. and Khadim is a Senegalese man 
who was selling some like knickknacks that he brought back from him was from selling all dolls and leather wallets and stuff like that. When we run it back. Yeah, uh, maybe just like half a yeah, second. Yeah, why don't we? Yeah, that'd be great because uh, I love yeah. this story too. So, so Khadim, he had just gotten back from Senegal, and he was he had like a kiosk there at De Anza in the quad, and he was selling like some dolls and like leather wallets and knickknacks and things. And and I walk up to him, and uh, and I'm just looking at some of the things, and he says, "How are you, brother?" And I said, "Oh, I'm I'm, I'm doing well, thank you." And then he's the next thing he said to me, he goes, "Brother, are you a Muslim?" And I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not a Muslim. I said, but, you know, I bought a Quran last night. And he just, like, his smile, like, he glowed. And he was just like, that's so beautiful. And he came around, he gave me a hug. And I, although it was weird, it felt good <laughs> at the same time. Like, I felt like I wasn't supposed to like it, but I did kind of like it. You know, and it was just, yeah. it, was, it, was, it, was, it was genuine and it was yeah. real. And then, you know, we just kept talking a little bit. But he didn't mention anything about Islam. He just said, that's good. And then he just started talking about what we were talking about. Uh, and then he says to me, he says, I'm a Muslim. And he says, you know, we pray five times a day. And he said, right now is one of the times of prayer and we can't delay it. We have to, we have to pray in the time. And I said, okay, yeah, no, no, no problem at all. And he said, so you have to excuse me. I said, yeah, yeah, man, do your, do your thing. He said, will you do me a favor? Yeah. And I said, sure. He said, can you watch, uh, my stand for me? I said, yeah, okay. And he, and he showed me his cash box and he goes, here's the cash. He said, if someone comes, if you could just sell this for this much and this for this much, that I would really appreciate that, brother. And I was like, cool. And he left. Now, I'm not Muslim. Yeah. So I'm thinking, man, I could take his cash, right? Yeah. I could take his cash right now yeah. and he would, I could avoid him easily. He would never find me. He doesn't exactly. know who I am, doesn't know my name or anything. And then immediately after I had that thought, it occurred to me, he knows that too. Hmm. He knows I could take it. And he doesn't care. And then wow. immediately in my heart, I said, whatever made him not care, that's what I want. Yeah. Right? And he was gone for a long time. Literally like a half an hour. I kid you not, bro. I, I you he went so to Bankara, so to Iran. <laughs> in, right. in, in, in his door, bro. And then he came back. But this is important. And this is important for me on so yeah. many levels. This next moment when yeah. he's coming back. Uh, because this is a dark, swarthy, black yeah. African man, right? right? The dark, dark, dark him. complexion. Yeah. Uh, and when he returned from prayer, he looked different. And I felt like his face was glowing. And later on, after I converted, I understood about Noor and yeah. the concept of light on faces. But I had never witnessed this before in my life. Like, he looked prophetic to me when he was coming back. And, like, if he would have been f f floating across the quad, it would have just been perfect. You know, end credits, <laughs> great movie, right? Works out perfect. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he comes back and he's just like, thank you, brother, so much for, you know. And I actually had sold a couple of things for him. And he was just so, so thankful. Immediately after that, a Pakistani man walks up with long hair, uh -huh. long, long hair, like, like a mullet type thing, and a Metallica shirt. And he comes and they greet and they says salam to him, and they, you know they hug each yeah. other. And then he turns to me and says, "How are you?" I said, I'm, "I'm, I'm, good." And then he looked at me and then he says to me too, he says, "Are you a Muslim, brother?" And I was like, "No," but now my mind is spinning, like you know, I'm, I'm like in my twenties now, yeah. and never in my life has someone asked me if I was Muslim ever. And now on this day, the day after I buy a Quran, two people ask me if I'm Muslim. And then so Khadim explains to me, he says, no, he's not a Muslim. He said, but he bought a Quran last night. And the same thing, he gave me a hug. He's like, this is so great. And I, I was thinking to myself, why they're so genuinely happy for me to have a Quran. Like, that's, right. a, that's a pretty amazing thing. Like, I've bought a lot of Bibles and, you know, and carried Bibles and no one's ever yeah. happy for me. Like, oh, you got a Bible? Wow. <laughs> it was never like, a, okay. a, a, like a, 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 big, a big deal to them. And so the, the Pakistani brother's name was Suhail. And he says to me, he says, have you ever been to a mosque? And I said, no, I've, I've, never, been, I've never been to a mosque. He said, would you like to go to one? I said, sure. He said, tomorrow's a great day to go. It was Juma. Uh, he said, you know, if you want, I can pick you up and, you know, you can come to my house and have lunch with me and my mother. It's Ramadan now, right? So you come to my house and have lunch with me and my mother and I'll, I'll take you to the mosque. And I was like, sure, man. I, I had never met people that were just nice like this to strangers right like offer you to take you bring you to lunch and right. so i was now are you consciously thinking like it's also dispelling the notion of islam being a arab religion well yeah because this guy's black and they're like they're like right. embraced you know and so I mean. it seems you know it okay. seems cool and, and i have to be honest right. it was a bit exotic for me as an american kid from the inner city in sacramento 
to have this black African speak with his African accent and then this Pakistani guy speak with his accent, mm-hmm. it was exotic yeah. to me. You know, like right. I was I was in it right now. You know, <laughs> right. if there was a place to be, it's right here. This is the cultural fusion, nice. you know. It's nice. going on. Uh, and so he picks me up the next day on Friday, comes to my house, picks me up, and we drive to his house. Uh, and again, I don't know much about Islam at this point. Like, I literally, I haven't been the guy who's studying it. It was literally a day before right. that I bought the Quran. Beyond that, it was Nation of Islam. That's what I knew. Uh, and so we go to his house, and, and his mother's there, and I, I meet her, and they've got food spread out. And his mother and I sit down, and she's like, eat. And I told I asked him, are you going to eat? He goes, no, no, I'm not, I'm not eating. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not, I'm not going to eat. And I was like, okay, is that strange? Well, I'll eat with your mother. Uh, and later on, I realized that he's fasting. he's fasting. You know, his mother's elderly. Right. She was, she was elderly. She didn't have to fast. Right. Uh, but we eat, and, and you know, we're just talking. And they didn't bring up religion at all, at all. They're just asking me about my life, yeah. what my hopes and dreams were. Do I have siblings? What did they do? You know, just totally yeah. normal right. humans interacting. You know, total normal conversation. Right. Right. Um, so after lunch, uh, he says, "You know, we're going to go to a mosque." And he says, "And you know, as Muslims, we, we like to be purified before we go." He said, so if, if, if it's okay with you, it'd probably be better if you took a shower before you went. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay. So I guess that was like my first whistle without intention. <laughs> uh, right. But if I was Hanifi, it would be cool, right? Yeah, 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 it would. I was going to say, intention before whistle? What's that? <laughs> so I did. And it, it, the, the interesting thing is it wasn't strange right. to me. It didn't feel like I, if any other time you go to someone's house, like, hey, man, you should take a shower. <laughs> You'd be offended, you know? <laughs> I was going to say, it but must it, have been but little. It felt, yeah. it felt but, like... I'm going to go to a holy place here. And so that makes sense that I would purify myself. You know, I was used to just touching my hand in the, the holy water and doing the father, son, holy spirit thing. So this, it kind of made sense to me. So we did that, went to the mosque before Juma at the MCA, uh, Muslim community association in Santa Clara, California, California. Yeah. We're about a half an hour early before Juma prayer. Okay. Uh, I walk in behind him and there was a group of about 30 men waiting for me. Uh, all different nationalities. The majority of them were indo but but all different yeah. nationalities there, and they were all greeted me when I when I came in. And then Sohail said to me, he said, he said, I told them that I was bringing you, and they were all they wanted to come early because they wanted to, to meet you. And it wasn't weird for me. Like I thought, like now in retrospect, I should have thought, like, wow, this is kind of maybe they're about to induct me into some cult or something, you know. But it, it just seemed I was so hungry yeah, for that right. that it just any I was going to take it anyway, right? Right, right? And so I met them. We sat down. And then now they started to talk to me about, about religion. They started to explain the, the concept of Allah, the books, the angels, the day of judgment, uh, all of it, right? And so we're sitting there talking for maybe like 15, 20 minutes. And afterwards, they said, do you have any questions for us? And I said, no, you know, it all seems to make kind of, it kind of makes sense, you know. And so the, the man that was there, I remember his name still, Anisu, he said, he said, would you like to become a Muslim? I didn't hesitate, Akhi. I didn't hesitate. I said, yeah. And even when I said it, I was surprised at myself. Like, right. did I just say that? Yeah, you know, like I said, out of, yeah. Out of body type experience. I said, yeah. And then they said, great. And so wow. uh, he took my hand and Sohel was there. And Sohel put his hand on mine and I and I, I butchered uh, the Shahada. <laughs> you know, I, mm. the Arabic was probably all yeah. off. Uh, mm. and, and, I, and, and after I said my Shahada, they stood up and they all gave me hugs. And I prayed Juma. Uh, that was the 17th. I took Shahada on the Battle of Badr on the 17th oh, of Ramadan. Ramadan. Right. Uh, and so I, that was your first time entering a mosque. Entering a mosque. Happened to be, con- you know, the day of congregation. Yeah. And so you happened to pray your first Jummah as a Muslim. As a Muslim. Right. At, at the MCA, right. where there's probably the largest congregation of people meet That's here insane. in the Bay Area. Oh, yeah. And so there was a thousand people it's at a least, me- It's, it's a mega mosque. It's, it's mega- one of the certain mega mosques that we have. And so after my... After we pray, they get on the microphone and they announce that Brother Brian just embraced Islam right before the Salat. Um, they said, so please welcome him and greet him. Now, I didn't know what that meant. Hmm. I did after half an hour <laughs> yeah, of meaning, hugging people. Right. <laughs> uh, and then I also learned a lot about Muslim cultures, too. Yeah. That some cultures, they kiss you on your cheek very close to your lips. <laughs> Now, as a kid from Sacramento, yeah, 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 this course. was like, okay, what's going on here? But I felt the love. I really yeah. did. And I remember after when people were coming up to hug me, I remember I kept, I kept in my head, I kept saying, Asian looks, you know, this guy looks Asian, African, 
I don't know where he's from, Middle Eastern. Yeah. There's a white guy, right? Yeah. Like, he was a Syrian, but yeah. for me, it was like a white guy, right? And uh, at this yeah. point in 1996, at the MCA, they tell me there had only been a handful of Shahadas there wow. before that. And so it was a big deal. Yeah. It was a big deal to them. I stayed for an hour or so after Juma, and everyone was still there. Like, literally, I was sitting in a congregation of like 50 to 100 people just talking and I got so many phone numbers from people, you know, and I gave my phone number to people. It was literally the most, uh, there's not words for it, mm-hmm. for that, for that experience. Uh, you know, and I've told this story several times. Uh, there's part that I haven't, haven't told before. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was just out of, of fear of what people would think. Uh, but I, I think it's important to say it. The moment I said my Shahada, my eyes were closed and after I finished saying the Shahada, uh, I immediately opened up my eyes in a in a sort of a frightful way, because I literally and I kid you not, Allah is my, my witnesses, Ramadan, Allah and this is mm-hmm. the truth. I felt like I lifted, I, I floated off the ground. I, I felt like I started to rise up in the air, mm-hmm. and I got scared, and I, so I opened my eyes to make sure that I was still sitting down. Now later, after studying overseas mm-hmm. and talking to some of my sh- my mashayikh, mm-hmm. they say that is the spiritual manifestation of sins being lifted. So you oh. you you your soul yeah. felt light. lighter. Your right. soul felt lighter. And since I've talked to other converts who have converted, and they all mention the same thing that they yeah. felt really really yeah. light, really really light afterwards. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's the positive uh, conversion <coughs> story, the one that everyone wants to hear. There's another version of it, uh, which is post shahada which is the story that most converts don't tell. Mm. Uh, and the reason that we don't tell that story is that we're so accustomed to people asking us our conversion stories. We have understand now why they're asking. They're not asking, why did you convert? They're asking to be inspired by your story. And so if you have an uninspirational story, you, you don't, I, I, I joke about it. I say, I think when people ask what they want to hear is I was walking down the street, cloud came, Right. lightning hit me in the chest. I fell unconscious. I woke up. I saw a law tattooed on my chest and I knew I had to be Muslim. Right. And they'd be like, mashallah, brother. But for the most people, for most people, it's, I studied the religion for a while. Uh, Conversion is not an event. No, it's, it's not. It's a process. Right. It's a process. Not an event. Uh, and probably the story that you're not hearing, and if, yeah. if we're honest, is your girlfriend was, boy, was, was Muslim or boyfriend was Muslim and so that I had to convert so that we could get married. Uh, that's not going to be messaged uh, publicly. Mm-hmm. But... For the next few days after my conversion, yeah. it was hard, really, really hard, uh, because I converted in a in a in an immigrant community, mm. and I was given a swal khamis, and I was told this is what you wear, and I immediately put it on because I wanted to be a Muslim. So I'm walking around, you know, the Bay Area like, like a Pakistani. I went yeah. to Valley Fair Mall uh, with that on, <laughs> the, which is Westfield Mall now. Yeah. Uh, I ran into some friends and they're just like, dude, why are you wearing your pajamas outside? <laughs> uh, but beside that, the lonely moments were me trying to pray uh, and being in Sajda and having Shaitan come and say, there's no God. Why are you doing this? You're wasting your time. You look like a fool. Look at you bouncing your head up on the ground. On the And so I had these thoughts after I converted, but you can't tell anybody that. Yeah. Right. Even even I feel shy mentioning it now, oh, you know, like, like you know, eighteen years after Shahada, hmm. but it was hard after I converted. I was still trying to convince myself that this was the right thing, and that took years, took years to happen. I wanted it so bad, and I believed in it so much that I wasn't going to stop no matter what. Uh, and I would have been willing to have sort of an unspiritual spiritual life as a Muslim. I would have kept doing it, uh, but that spirituality and the and the and the you know, enjoying prayer and yeah. enjoying like the religious acts didn't come until much, much later, yeah. much, much later. Right. Uh, and so then, um, uh, now you're, are you going to MCA at all? I did. Okay. I did. You know, that became my mosque, you know, so, cause I'm thinking 96, what, I mean, Sheikh Hamza's there. You Sheikh Hamza's Hamza? there. I met Sheikh Hamza, uh, that weekend. After you convert, after I converted, I converted on Friday. Yeah. I met him on Saturday. He had a he had a, a religious interfaith talk at Santa Clara University the wow. next day. So okay. this is this is at a point before Sheikh Hamza is kind of the national. Oh no, he's not known yet. I mean, he's, he's basically the resident imam at the MCA. Uh, he's still working as a nurse, yeah. uh, and he's still he's, continuing his education at San Jose State. And he had just recently returned from 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 Mauritania, so he's reacclimating. Right. To America. I mean, by 96, though, and we talked about this, it's funny because we talked about this in the next room when we were talking with Sidi Osama, but 
by 96, he's on the upward trajectory, though. Sure. I, 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 I was sharing my experiences because, if correct me, if, well, at least with Osama, this is like September, Osama converts. Yeah. And I was sharing, so he, and he said September 96, and I so automatically in my mind, I'm thinking, what was I doing when I, in September 96? September, September 96 would have been me returning from ISNA mm. in, in Cleveland. Mm. And by then, Sheikh Hamza was already primetime ISNA. I didn't even know Ismail was that. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Because it was, and I, and I, and I bring that up. No, I brought that up with Osama for the same reason I'm bringing it up now, which is to say that, um, not only to say that, okay, where was Sheikh Hamza, but you know, where, like it just when I hear your story, as as when I heard Osama's story, you know, it automatically makes you reflect on where I was, mm. you know, at that time, and then, but like you're saying, but and in, in not only my, you know, having these completely different set of experiences, Isna's a thing. I mean, it's not definitely a thing in the in the mid '90s, and arguably still is. But that entire universe, as it were, is completely unknown to you. I don't know anything. You know, right? About it. Exactly. You are MCA, if that Santa Clara. I know two mosques. Sunday, Sunday, I know Masjid yeah. Nur right. and MCA. And you know a handful of people. And then they're sister, like sister, apart. and they're two miles apart, sister mosques. Right. So I just know the same group of people. Right. That's and, it. And, and before the age of the internet, before YouTube, yep. I can't even tell you to go plug in and watch some no. videos or something. Right. So it's like. Whoever you have access to on the ground, tactically, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And so right. we latched on to people. Right. Like we would. I would go to the masjid at Fajr to, to learn how to how to say my prayer. Right. Like that's that's literally what we did. So right. so almost yeah, by so happenstance, you have access to Sheikh Hamza. Yeah. On a one to one basis. I mean, yeah. yeah, and that actually would, yeah. that actually ends up becoming uh, a regular thing. Right. So I met Sheikh Hamza that night, and he was. I mean, he was always Sheikh Hamza, but he was. Sheikh Hamza at that time. He was becoming <laughs> Sheikh Hamza. I don't think he was known really outside of, of uh, these conventions. Of, of these conventions and, and on, he was on the lecture yeah. circuit. Uh, and but, as things happen, I mean, even locally, he may not have been a big name. You know, he yeah, could have been no. more of a national thing. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That happens a lot. But yeah. I remember yeah. watching him yeah. speak with the rabbi and the Christian. At uh, that interfaith. At that interfaith. And I just remember, you know, thinking, this is probably the most brilliant man alive like literally this like yeah. there was they couldn't get him on anything right. he knew their books better than them yeah. and then and then i remember uh hearing him speak arabic and i was just like wow we can do that like americans we wow. can like he's amazing like this is the most amazing person and then after the the event downstairs uh there were people gathered to meet him. People were like were in awe, you know, trying to shake his hand. He had a huge crowd around him. There was also a group that was there trying to jam him up. You know, you recited this wrong. There was a you know little faction group here in the Bay Area that didn't like him, and so they were trying to jam him up. And so I'm watching all this, how he handles them, and I'm just kind of in the background. And he looks up over at me, and he and he looks up over at me. And he goes, "How how are you?" And I said, "I'm, said, I'm, I'm fine." He goes, "What's your name?" I said, I'm, uh, "My name is Brian." He goes, "Welcome, welcome, Brian." And then I said to him, "I said I, I just uh, converted yesterday." And he goes, wow, mashallah. And he goes, your name again? I said, Brian. He goes, welcome, welcome, Brian. And then he had to keep going with okay. people. Uh, huh. The next Juma at the MCA, he gave the chutbah. Nice. Uh, and I was in the bookstore. The MCA bookstore was our hangout. Nice. That was that was our Google for Islam at that time. <laughs> we would be in there for hours right. after Juma. Literally, we would pray Juma, and there's some days that we were there till Isha, mm -hmm. just in the bookstore, trying on kufis, like, <laughs> like the like the the plastic kufi, you know, trying that on. Just the bowl. The, yeah. the bowl. The plastic bowl. The the the, 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 the yeah. Palestinian scarf, oh, yeah. you know. We were just anything. We're yeah. just Muslim. Like just yeah. give us anything, you know. Uh, and then I was in the bookstore and Sheikh Hamza was in there and he walked in and I was there and, and he looked over and he goes, Brian. And I said, he remembered my name. To this day, I can't tell you how much that affected me. To wow. this day, I still get goosebumps wow. thinking about it. Right. That this amazing scholar right. saw me one time right. for 15 seconds. A week later, he remembers my name. And I, I, I knew who he was. He, I saw all those oh, people. Yeah. He was a rock star, right? right and I knew that that's impossible for him to remember my name. And so he just he came over and he started talking to me, asked me about my life. And uh, that was it for me. Uh, from that point on, he invited me to his house to, to come learn. I started studying Maliki Fiqh with him from this like lime green book called Malachite Jurisprudence. Um, and I would walk <laughs> over to his house, uh, several times a week, you know, uh, just at lunchtime, he lived on Monroe in, in Santa Clara. I, I would walk over there and I would just sit and I would, I would, I would study with him. In fact, I, I wanted to choose the name Khadim, uh, for myself out of respect for, for Khadim and she comes and says, this is a good name. He goes, but you should, you should maybe think about Mustafa. 
and so I, it stuck and I, and I and I chose I chose Mustafa uh, from that point on uh, so that was that was it and then you know in in September Osama called me we were still at school together yeah. and and but um, we still had kind of the same same crowd and Osama was just hanging with the Muslims right he was just he he already knew how to pray. He knew how to make wudu, all that stuff, but he just didn't commit yet, right? He was, and so one day he calls me and he says, "Hey man, tell me about Islam, right?" right? And I said, "Okay." And so we went to dinner, uh, Royal Taj in Campbell, California, right? Had vegan food, right? <laughs> you can bring that up with them. <laughs> Had vegan food, and we talked about it. we talked about Islam. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the next day, I said, "Let's go to the mosque." He said, "Okay." It was Juma, and so we went to the MCA. Mm-hmm. And we went to the MCA, and I told the imam before the salat, I said, someone's going to take the shahada after right. the salat. We prayed in the back. And so we prayed, did our turakas, you know, uh, did our taslim. And then the, the imam gets on the mic and said, someone's going to take their uh, their brothers. Please stay seated. Someone's going to embrace Islam. Right. And I nudge him. I go, that's you, Ak. And he goes, he goes what? I said, that's you, bro. Mm. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, bro, you're... Don't make them wait, man. There's all these people that they're looking back at us now, man. Just go. And so he like reluctantly. Yeah. <laughs> he tells people that I forced him to take his shahada. <laughs> In a way, I did, but he was ready. Dang. Come on, he just made wudu and prayed juma with us perfectly, yeah. right? <laughs> and so he went up there and he said his shahada there, and that was September. And so he was basically the reason that I converted in in February. Um, and I wouldn't say that I was the reason that he did because his brother was already Muslim, but I was the one that took him to the mosque and then he took his shahada in, in, in September. And it's interesting that, you know, our paths went different ways. I went overseas to Mauritania, Syria, Sudan, Morocco, and Yemen. And then he was in, uh, Morocco, Medina and, and Egypt. Egypt. And so we kind of went for like a decade. No, we still hung out when I was back and stuff. But then it's it's interesting that our past started together, and now we're both here. Yeah, you know, right. founding director and co-founder of this organization, whose you know goal is to take care of the needs of converts and you know right. sort of disenfranchised Muslims. And we'll definitely get to Talif. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely want to get to Talif. But um, before, so you, you you alluded to the fact that now you have you, both of you, and I think different time periods, you spent I think a great amount of time overseas. But what was the, what's happening? So you've converted now, you're taking these private classes with Sheikh Hamza. What was the impetus to go abroad? So Sheikh Hamza brought Sheikh Khatri Utbe. Got it. Here. Uh, which is From basically Mauritania. a Mauritanian yeah, sage, that's right. right? He's a faqi and he's just a, he's just a sage. If anybody who's met him, if you see his, his noble face, mm-hmm. you just, you fall in love immediately. And then not only that, but you just know this is a serious man and he's about business. Right. And he really was. Mm. Uh, and so we had a small apartment that the brothers were kind of renting together uh, on Jefferson Avenue in Santa Clara. Mm. Uh, and Sheikh Hamza was just a few blocks away in Monroe at that time. And so he brought Sheikh Hathri and we would literally have daily fit classes with Sheikh Hathri mm. there. Uh, and then that was that was for me, that was it. Like, you know, this is just literally just, you know, a few months, you know, four or five months after I'm Muslim. Here comes a more a Mauritanian scholar giving you pure religion. You don't have to filter it. You know that this is the real deal. First time he's ever left the desert, you know, to, to, to come here. To the extent, they took him through a drive through once and he got freaked out about the voice. Like the voice that was, that was talking. He was right. like, where's the person? He's like looking around. That's how Bedouin. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. how wow. Bedouin it was. So right. we would be there in that apartment uh, every day. And then, you know, in September, I believe it was also, or maybe shortly after, uh, Yahya returns from college. Okay. Sheikh Yahya, who's known as Sheikh Yahya Rodas now. Uh, he and Usama were, were very close friends growing up. Okay. Uh, I didn't know Yahya. Uh, I met him the night before he took his shahada. They, they came to my house and I had a dinner, uh, a dinner for them. And the next day, Usama took him to, to the MCA uh, to take his shahada. Sheikh Khatri happened to be at, this was actually the day of the arrival of Sheikh Khatri. Mm. They take him to the MCA. And the first thing he witnesses when he comes to America is the Shahada. And huh. they said he was in tears mm. because he's Mauritanian. He's never seen a Shahada. Right. He's read about it. He knows about it. That's but he's right. never seen somebody embrace the faith. Yeah. So uh, he takes Yahya under his wing and tells him, no, you can come back and you can study with me. You know. And so Yahya, the next day after he takes a Shahada, says, I met this Mauritanian sage man. He said, I can go study with him. He said, come with me. I'm going to breakfast at Tarif al-Arabi's house. Mm. Uh, he said, I'm going to breakfast at Tarif's house. And uh, he's going to be there. Come meet him. So I was like, cool. I went there, had breakfast, met him. Tarif was translating for us. 
And I just said to him, I said, Sheikh, I never met anybody like you. Uh, I want to really do this religion right. I would love to study with you. And he said, you're welcome. You'll come back with me. Wow. And so I went. Literally, it was it was the next May that I left to Mauritania. Right. Uh, and it was still very new then. Now, I knew three, two or three words, I think. I knew... Inera. Yeah. I, I knew the alphabet, but that was it. I knew uh, Chubbs, uh Matt, and Tom. That was it. So I knew how to say food, <laughs> water, and bread. Right. Like, that's my survival skills in the desert. This is all I need. I'll be good. <laughs> Bathroom, you're out of luck. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I knew, the, I knew those words. And so uh, he said, you can come back with me. When I go back, Yahya was still finishing up stuff for school. So he came about four months later. But when I went there, uh, I was the first American convert to go to Mauritania after Sheikh Hamza. Uh, Mutinus uh, was there studying at the time when I got there. Nice. Uh, And he was already doing well. He was advanced. He was studying Muhtas al-Khalil at that Mm -hmm. time. But he was up at Marapta Hajj's village. And I was in Gero, Mm -hmm. Mauritania, where Sheikh Hatri lived. It was like a National Geographic film. If I walked outside on the streets, like if I walked anywhere, literally, I kid you not, there was like 50 to 100 people walking behind me in a crowd, just like, what the heck is that? And they would call me Christian. They would say, they would call me Nasrani ah. because I didn't speak Arabic and right. my skin is light complected. And so they would say, does he speak Arabic? And I'd say, no. Does he speak French? No. And then they would always ask, like, well, is he like stupid? Like, does he, <laughs> does he not, is right, he not educated? For a lot of these people, I mean, even the concept of a of a Jewish person or a Christian is like theoretical almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right? they get to see a Christian. I mean, they have the French that come there. Oh, right. Okay. They have so the, they have there, the French some that, that come okay. there, but it was a strange thing for them that he's a Muslim and, and doesn't speak study Arabic. And doesn't speak Arabic. And doesn't speak Arabic. Right. So they're like, how is he, how is yeah. he Muslim? Right. It was frustrating wow. for me because I would like be about to eat and there'd be like a five-year-old or six-year-old kid that would be there next to me and say, Qul bismillah. Say bismillah. And I'm like, I'm not dumb. I know. I just don't speak Arabic. I know to say bismillah. It was like really frustrating for me. I'm a grown man at this point, you know, and I got these little kids. It was a really big ego, ego. Yeah, uh, yeah. More training uh-huh. was hard. Okay. I would, I would not stretch the truth and say that it was easy. It was are, are, very, are you, very. Are you married at this point? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I got married literally five days before I left to Mauritania okay. with Sheikh uh, Shekhatri. Okay. Five days before I left, and I go to Mauritania. Right. Uh, and so Sheikh Hatri was building a room on his house at that time for my wife and I to stay in. Okay. And so he's literally, he was very, very right. serious about us coming to stay with him and live with him. Right. And he, we walked through the house that was being built. He said, this is going to be a room. You and your wife will right. stay here. Um, but so, I, just, just real, so you, you, you your, your wife is, lives here. You, you, you meet her yep. through some people, you know, yeah, her, 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 she's a, she's a born Muslim, born Muslim. Right? Yeah. From Somalia, yeah. her and her brother and I were, were friends. Okay. And so then I asked for, and then we ended up getting married. Then I left. Great. Okay. Three days in Mauritania. If I would have had a satchel filled with a million dollars, I would have given it to anybody to fly me out of there. Hmm. It was difficult. I had never been alone. Yeah. And I'm in Mauritania now, 23 years old. Uh, Some of the stuff that drugs used to suppress starts to surface. I don't have anything. I don't have TV. I don't have radio. I brought only two books with me. I read them both the first three days. (laughs) I only had two books with me. And I I can't talk to anyone. No one there speaks English. Not a word of English. They speak French and Arabic. I don't speak either of those. So I'm by myself. I wrote in my journal. And I'll show it to you sometime. I wrote in my journal. That if it was possible for me to get up and run across the room and knock myself out on the wall just to fall unconscious so I could stop thinking, I would have done it. I would have done it. Because it's just noise, noise of yeah, me. Yeah, I'm yeah, in yeah. my head. I'm the starting top. to surf. I was able to suppress oh, yeah, myself for a long time. Yeah. But I'm starting to surface now. And I can't talk to anybody, so I'm just in my head yeah. the entire day. It was literally like solitary confinement. Like I was no. just, I was it's, just stuck. And especially for people like I think millennials or people listening to, I mean, I, I mean, I imagine a chunk of the audience listening. Just that idea of just being completely unplugged <laughs> is in the like. You, if this were to happen, you know, imagine what happened to you in the mid '90s. If this was now. It'd be a whole different story. Yeah. You'd be able to plug into your phone. You'd have your oh, iPhone no. with you. You'd have satellite phone. You'd have your, exactly. Yeah, they have the internet probably there. So yeah. in how much has changed in 20 years? So like, I mean, it's a completely different, I mean, it's a Hardest world. thing I've ever done in my right, life. Right. Best thing for yeah. me. Yeah. Right. But the and hardest thing, I mean, the hardest, therapy. hardest thing I've ever done in yeah. my life. Um, but I got immersed, you know, mm. and after, you know, two, three weeks, I just realized 
I had to submit and I've just got to become Bedouin in order to, to do this. So I just did what they did. Yeah. Showered when they showered, slept when they slept, and then read Quran when they were reading Quran. I was just, you know, trying to read, sound out the letters. I was writing on my wooden tablet, too, on my loa. Uh, and I was studying. You know, Sheikh Khatri, a scholar of his caliber, would sit with me for hours every day and just go over Fatiha with mm. me. Just literally just so I could learn how to recite it properly, you know. Just go over different surahs with me. And still to this day, subhanAllah, 18 years later, the surahs that he taught me, I recite them like him. Like still to this day, that's because that's how I memorized it. Yeah. And so I recite them like him. Um, four months later, uh, yeah. Yahya comes. Okay. And I was a better one at that point. Because I remember he walked in at Maghreb time and my attitude was just kind of like, oh, what's up, dude? <laughs> right. <laughs> to this day, he still brings it up because that was the coldest welcome <laughs> I've ever gotten from you. Uh, he comes. Great. Uh, and then, you know, everything changes for me mm. at this point. Uh, he brings letters from my wife. Um, he oh, brings himself. I was by right. myself in Mauritania, yeah. And oh, you, you said that, right? Yeah, so yeah. You, so I left Mauritania. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he brings letters for me. Mm. Uh, I start to remember what I left, and this takes me out of where I was, like the state that I was in. It brings me back into that to my old state again, and I want to leave them at that point. Mm. I was fine. Right. I'm not blaming Yahya. Yeah, yeah. Just for people listening, <laughs> I'm not blaming Sheikh Yahya. Yeah. I asked him to bring yeah, the letters, yeah. you know. And then we went out to Marapta Hajj's village when Yahya came. I wanted to wait for Yahya. Okay. So I didn't go out there until mm. Yahya came. Before he came, I got really sick. Uh, they think I had malaria. Uh, I was like deathly ill. Like they were hand feeding me. Uh, I was in bed for literally like two or three weeks. And like they, they were like literally like hand feeding me. They were like washing me yeah. and stuff. And I was, I was really, really sick. I didn't think I was going to die. I didn't feel like that. But right. when Sheikh Abdullah, um, Muraf al Hajj's grandson, came down and, and I met him for the first time, he actually went back and got Mutnis. This is the first time I met Mutnis. He got Mutnis and told Mutnis to come back to Gero because your friend's dying. And so that's why Mutnis came. And so I met I met with Mutnis then. And then he had, had to go back to his studies. And so when Yahya came, we went out to Tuamra. I stayed there a week. That was it. I couldn't do any more. I couldn't do any more. It was so hot there. In such a harsh environment, people like Yahya and Mutnis and, and, and Sheikh Hamza and, and these other people that went out there and stayed there for years, right. Allah bless them. Like they are, they, these are these are men. <laughs> these are I couldn't hang. It literally felt like I was someone opened up an oven and stuck me inside, and then put a fan on full blast and was just throwing sand at me. Like wow. it was really really difficult for me. I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it. Uh, Yahya struggled that first time too, and we left and we went to the, we went to a phone and we called Sheikh Hamza because that was when the first dean intensive was happening in Nottingham, England. Okay. And so we said, you know, we want to leave and go to the dean intensive, yeah. and then study a little bit and then and yeah. then and then come back here. So Sheikh Hamza said, that's fine. You know, you can you can come. Wow. We went went to the dean intensive, uh, and then from there came back home. I ended up going to Syria. Yahya went to Syria. He went back to Mauritania. I've never been back since. Mm. I want to go back though. Right. I have to go because that's 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 the beginning. That's, that's right. The beginning Genesis for me, right you know? there. So you're in Syria um, pursuing other studies, studying at Arabic you. at Damascus yeah. University. Okay. Okay. Uh, stay there for a year. Right. Uh, went to Sudan for a few months. Is Imam Zaid there at the time. Imam Zaid is there. Okay. Imam Zaid, mashallah, Allah bless him. Yeah. Imam Zaid today in 2014 is the same Imam Zaid that I yes. met back in 1998. Absolutely. Uh, he picked me up from the airport and took me around the city, showed me how to get around. He literally must have spent eight, ten hours with me that day. Mm. Uh, and I didn't never, I didn't know who he was. Damascus. Damascus. This is in Damascus, yeah. yeah. And he became, whenever there was trouble or issues, the guy who was there, Johnny on the spot, always had time for you. Mm. Always, always had time Beautiful. for you. But again, here's that that prophetic character that that's impacted me still to this day. Like when I think about Syria, there's no way I would have been able to do Syria without Imam Zaid. Mm. Uh, I met Sheikh Jihad Brown there. Uh, Imam Dawood Yassin was was Dawood Yassin was still studying his Arabic program. Imam Zaid was still in the last year of his Arabic program when yeah. I got there. Um, Ibrahim Osiefa was there. Okay. Sheikh Abdul Karim Yahya was there. Sheikh Mohammed Mendez uh, was there at the time too, uh, and so that became our our core group, nice. you know, and we kind of followed each other wherever he sort of went around the world uh, studying from that point. So how long were you in Syria then? Syria was about a year, a little bit over a year. And then from there... And then I went to and then Sudan for a few months, and then I went to Morocco, and I was in Morocco for about six months. You overlapped with Osama? Uh, I came... Morocco, Osama was in Morocco first. I came for his wedding. Okay. And then I stayed. Right. Uh, and then he, had, he, he came back home. Right. And then from... 
from Morocco, I came back home for a little bit, and then that's when we went to Yemen. And then that, I had my family with me. So okay. in Syria and all these other places, yeah, my yeah, family. As soon as I left Morocco, my family, children, was, your, your family kids, was coming. Then, with me, yeah. Right, right. Uh, my daughter was born in Yemen, uh, and then we went from Yemen. We were there in Yemen about five years. Hadramaut, Hadramaut, yeah. in Tarim. Yeah. Studied at Dar al Mustafa. Yeah. First, I studied at Badr Institute oh, for, okay. for language, language for Arabic, right. and then I went to Dar al Mustafa. Uh, and That's then where you meet my friend Omar, right? Yep, exactly. Right. And okay. then uh, while I was studying in Dar al Mustafa, Habib Ali asked me. Habib Ali Jeffrey asked me to help him with some media things he was doing in Abu Dhabi. Okay. And so that's when I moved to Abu Dhabi and I started working for the Tapa Foundation. And I was there about four and a half years. And then we returned to the United States in 2008. Okay. And we've been here since. So, I mean, we could literally spend the entire episode, I think, just talking about your, like, your travels. But mm. I, 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 one of the things I, I really want to get to also is, because you've talked about this and you've shared this in, uh, you know, your own sort of Talib testimonials. Mm. And we'll get into the Talib a little bit later as well is the struggle that you have, um, you know, again, post-conversion, post-study of Islam, now to go back and say, you know what, embrace the fact that you always had this artistic drive mm-hmm. and to feel that somehow that your conversion had initially suppressed it mm. um, and why you felt that way and yeah. what was it that got you to, you know, again, yeah. unleash that sort of creative energy again. Great. So... I come from a family of artists. Okay. My father is a is a singer, and that's actually how he met my mom. This is performing on the road. And my mother and my mother's a painter, uh, and so the arts have always been instilled in us as as young children. I grew up playing piano, and and I picked up photography at the age of thirteen, and actually ended up going to a specialized high school for the arts. And so I, my goal was always to be a, a musician and a photographer. That's what I... That's Those what are your I, initial passions. That was my initial yeah. passions, yeah. Um, the the filmmaking part didn't come in until later in high school when my father bought a video store. Uh, and so I literally, instead of doing homework, would just watch like three or four movies a night. And then I realized... VHS, uh, VH, VHS exactly. <laughs> VHS. Uh, so, re, you, had to, you had to spend like five minutes rewinding. That's what I'm saying. You thought to be start, kind and rewind. Yeah. <laughs> before you start watching it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I remember watching the films and thinking, you know, this is so many arts in one. Mm. Like, you know, you can write. Because I wanted to be a writer as well. That was my initial passion. I wanted to be a photojournalist. I wanted to write and take photos. And piano was just sort of like my, my stress my stress release. Uh, and so I would watch those films and I would think, this is writing. This is photography. This is cinematography. There's music in it. This is all the arts combined. I, I think I might want to make films one day. Mm. Uh, and I didn't at that time, but it, that, that came later. Um, were you watching these movies kind of from a critical eye? I, was, I had notebooks and I was taking notes. Okay, okay yeah. so it was that kind of, yeah, a, yeah it wasn't yeah. just the avid movie goer. No, 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 and I was watching films that I wasn't interested in. Just so to any see particular how filmmakers, were, yeah, how, the, yeah, yeah. How, how they were We'd done. both be kind of in that. Uh, like, I was stuck, I think, like a lot of kids in that time. Yeah. I was I was stuck on, on Coppola, on Brian De Palma. I was watching a lot of Godfather, a lot of, a lot of gangster films, uh, on, on Lucas, on Spielberg. Okay. Uh, on that group of people, which is yeah. interesting, who were in film school together. Right, right. right? They're yeah. all in film Not school at the same time. Yeah. Some of them are at Tisch School of right. Arts in New York. Some of them are at USC. Mm-hmm. And then they all kind of graduate. And then they become the pioneers that really, you know, for all intents and purposes, have created modern cinema yeah. for us today. Right, right. You know? And they define a generation. Uh, they define right? it. Yeah, the, yeah. The, you know. And so those were like the guys that I was kind of mm-hmm. looking at. I wasn't really into independent films at that mm-hmm. time. And so the documentary stuff came 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 much came much later. Uh, so that was my, my upbringing. I was always around the arts and then I converted and, you know, like a lot of people that convert, you know, you're given a very extensive list of the things that you're no longer allowed to do. And art was one of those things. Uh, I was told that photography was impermissible. Um, that music was, was impermissible. Uh, I broke my piano. I broke my cameras. I smashed all my CDs. I spent a lot of money on CDs over the year, by the way, because I would smash them and I'd buy them back, and then I'd feel bad, and then I'd smash them again, and I'd buy them back. Man, I've spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on CDs <laughs> right. because of my conversion. Like, why did I spend so much money on the CDs? I was like, why did I, I should have just waited and downloaded it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then you could delete them off your hard drive and get them back. And, yeah. uh, but I was serious, man. Like yeah. when I converted, wow. you know, I'm coming from a pretty, you know. You not not even unique, just a pretty tremendous background, right. you know, and so my conversion is serious for me. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not a fad. It's like this is 
this is the last bus stop. Mm. You know, there's no more bus stops after this. Islam has to work for me. Mm. And so when they told me that music was haram, that art was haram, I took it serious. Mm. I didn't like that I had to do it, but then I was also taught at the same time, you don't have to like what you do. You just have to do it. And that's what a Muslim is. You give up what you have to give up. You don't drink. You don't do drugs. You don't have a girlfriend. Uh, all of that stuff. You just you quit it right away. Yeah. Uh, and so I did. I left it. And I left it for a number of years. For a number of years. Right. But I never filled... There was, that void was always there. Mm. I never filled it. Uh, and it wasn't until I was in my studies in Dara Mustafa and I, and I saw pic- pictures of my teachers and stuff on the walls and like, here's the people I'm learning thick from. There must be differences of opinion, you know. And so then I start studying and I start to realize, sure enough, yeah. there are differences. I wasn't taught that there were differences, you know. So I just, I ran with it. And it's very similar, you know, to the, you know, in the films and stuff that I do. Jordan Richter's story, the wayward, wayward son, the Jordan Richter story. It's, it's in many ways, my story. Mm-hmm. You know, he gave up something that he loved and finds out later that he can come back to it. I obviously didn't lose as much as, as Jordan lost yeah. in, in his It's story. almost like you needed that gap. Yeah. And I've talked to my teachers about it too, you know, angrily. You know, what? I lost so much. Right. And get, if I had been so much further ahead, and, you know, it was one of my teachers who said, no, had you not given it up, you would have continued to do it for the wrong reasons. Now you can re- revisit it for the right reasons, right? And that's why a lot of my art is, is Islamically themed, uh, you know, uh, not as a, something that I feel is necessary. It's just me creating art from within me, and Islam is infused in me, so that's going to come out. Yeah. In, it's going to come out in my, in my art. So it was... It was in Tareem when I found out that art was okay. Right. And not only that, it was my teachers in Tareem that sent me to film school. They paid for my film school. Wow. Uh, they, they're the ones that sent me to New York Film Academy. You know, to they said we see an inclination on the arts for you. You know, we're gonna we're gonna push mm-hmm. you in this. And then my first years after graduating uh, was spent serving serving them and and right. and the, the mission. And you know, and still I hope you know to some extent I am you know still serving them even if it's if it's indirectly. Uh, but now I'm just creating art for me, you know, the art that's, right. that's, that's, that's within me. And it just happens to be Islamically themed. So it was several years before I got back into the arts and I was bitter for a while yeah. about having, having lost it. But now, like, like Zaki said, I do consider it now a very necessary phase. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think I could have kept it, uh, and stayed grounded had I not left it for, you know, and then come back for the right reasons. Wow. Remarkable. Uh, so then now you're back and then, um, Let's see. So th- that's sort of the genesis of, or the, some of the work you're doing in, in, in Dubai, the genesis of like Mustafa, like Mustafa Davis Productions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right? we're, we're, we're so, I feel like we've gotten such a rich backstory. Yeah. I, we, I know we wanted to yeah. spend more time talking about your artistic endeavors. Yeah, but, exactly. But you know what, this, this gives us a chance to inshallah get you back. But, oh, but, Allah, but, but with the time that we have left, I mean, can, can you talk about some of the projects that you're working on right now and that, uh, Sure. Coming up too. Sure. Yeah. Or and and while you do that, or as you do that, do weave in Talif. We, we so we've gotten the Talif story. So from Osama's angle, and yeah. I'd love to, like Zaki said, have you back yeah. and talk about it from your point. I, of view. I think we're gonna have to. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Uh, but you know, sort of weave in the work that you're doing here, and and I think most of I would imagine that the vast majority of our listeners know about the work Talif is doing. Mm. So that goes without saying. Yeah. So uh, Tatleef, and I'll just be candid and very honest about this. You know, I'm, I'm listed as a co-founder of Tatleef, but really this is Usama Kanan's thing. You know, he 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 was on the ground here, you know, rooted in the trenches when we were all still overseas drinking tea. You know, he was here doing the real work. And and this is sort of the, the, his baby that kind of formulated from the auspices of, of Zaytuna and then, and then Zawiya and then it became Tatleef. Uh, and then when I came back, he asked if I could help him, and I said yes. You know, and he's just generous. He's a very generous man. So he said, "I'm going to list you as as, as co-founder." But really, I, I didn't have much to do with the inception of okay. of, of Tatleef. Uh, and so the work that I'm doing now for Tatleef, my my media work, uh, I wouldn't necessarily that, say that I do it for Tatleef because it's really the work that I would do if I was just doing it myself. Yeah. Like, there's not like a group of people that are like, you have to create this or you have to create this. I still have a lot of freedom in, in terms of like articulating my artist, my art, you know, through, through, through media. And so these projects that I'm doing, like wayward son, the Jordan Richter story, which is a story about a, a professional skateboarder converts to Islam is told that skateboarding is impermissible, leaves it and then finds that it's not, that it's okay to do it 15 years later, but now he's 37 years old, mm. lost those youth years. His peers are people like Tony Hawk, Christian Hasoy, Mark Gonzalez, all multimillionaires. Uh, so he lost a lot. 
And that's why I said that story is my story in some regards because I left what I love too, but I didn't lose on that, that. scale. I didn't lose on that on that scale. Right. Uh, I, I did a film for Tatleaf called Prison Blues, yeah. which is about uh, just to be honest, the unfair incarceration rate of of, of minorities in the United States, uh, and in particular with this film with the Muslim mm -hmm. uh, population inside, and how people find Islam and how they convert, and then uh, more so than just that, but how they acclimate to, to the general society when they come out and kind of what they're going through, what they're going through there. Uh, we just finished Goody's story, which mm -hmm. is a story about a Mexican American convert to Islam. Uh, it's not actually about his conversion. It's about his estranged relationship with his father coming from a, from a broken home. And that's sort of like my style, I think in, in the art. And what I try to do is I try to tell human stories. I don't necessarily enjoy doing topical films so I'm not out thinking like, I need to do a film about American Islam or I need to do a film about immigrants. I need to do a film about jihad or hijab or, you know, uh, halal versus haram. I, I usually just find those human stories that I connect with. And then that's the story that I want to tell. So right. even Prison Blues, even and though those, those, are, touched those, on. Are, those are themes in it, right. it's exactly. really about Rafi, the right. Peterson, the person. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's really about Amir, the, <coughs> the, the person. Mm. Who are they? What are their hopes and dreams, triumphs, struggles, desires, you know? issues that they're going through. And I try to do that. And I think as a, as a filmmaker who is Muslim, and I say that on purpose, I never say Muslim filmmaker. Yeah. I say as a filmmaker who is Muslim. And the reason I make that distinction is that I was an artist before I converted to Islam. I would have probably been doing art had I not been a Muslim. Uh, Islam, and this might be contentious for some people, Islam isn't the only thing that defines me. Mm. I'm Mustafa Davis, but I'm also Brian Davis. Yeah. I'm also a son a father, a friend, a musician, an artist. I'm a lot of things, and I might be more of one of those things on any given day. Right. Islam is my foundation, right. right? And not only am I foundation, but it's my roof over my head, too. So it's the filter which things come to me with, mm -hmm. and it's the foundation upon which I, which I stand on. Right. And the reason that I'm saying that is that I think in the Muslim arts, we're still stuck yeah. with this. Muslim filmmaker means you make only films that are about Islam. I don't believe in that. Yeah. I, I think we run into the issue of, I have a philosophy yeah. of, of why uh, we can cre create mediocre art and that it still gets praised abundantly. Mm. Uh, mediocre is me being being very <laughs> generous. Generous. It's um, the month of Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's right. Um, but I think that it's possible that because if the art itself, like for example, take like calligraphy, and if someone does like a uh, um, a painting or, or a calligraphy piece of Lafz Jalala, right? So yeah. it's Allah. Yeah. It's going to be difficult to say that's bad, mm. right? Because I think intrinsically we're thinking like maybe we're critiquing. God himself, right. or if there's like a film about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if it's horrible, I don't think Muslims are going to say it's horrible. Yeah. That's one. And then two, I think we just don't have enough artists creating right. good media right. that anytime we see anything on screen, that's on right. paper, on radio, whatever, that's Muslim. Yes, we're, we're excited about it, right. but we're, we're still a bit, yeah. we're, we're a bit away, I think, from where we need to be. Yeah. No, I mean, to me, it's not like, unlike when we had, like, remember, like, I remember right after 9-11 when we had so many people appearing on the media. It, it, in the beginning, I remember it was just kind of like, at least it's good to have a Muslim voice on there. Yeah. No matter how, if it was this guy with this serious accent or someone who couldn't <laughs> articulate very clearly or properly. But I think we've matured yeah. as a community because no, no. now we've had this sort of, you know, for the last, what, 12 years being kind of center stage, as it were. Um, and so hopefully with art, that'll, it'll, or with the artist, it'll be the same way. Inshallah. Then, then. I think that we're not going to really penetrate the mainstream with our media until we just start telling good stories. That's right. As a Muslim, I made a film called The Warm Heart of Africa uh, that's about Christian HIV AIDS orphans in Malawi. Yeah. And there's been some contention about this film in blogs and things about me online that, you know, why would a Muslim make a film with a Christian hero about Christian orphans? And my answer is always because you obviously wouldn't make that film. <laughs> And the, ironically, the, the reason this film came about is I was having a conversation with my father, and he said to me one day, he said, so you believe that Muslims have the last religion to come to mankind? And I said, yes, this, this is what I believe. And he said, you know, I'll believe that yeah. when I see Muslims caring about people other than themselves. Wow. And literally two weeks later, I was in Malawi purposely shooting a film about Christian orphans to show my father that yeah. we do, that mm, we do yeah. care, you know. Right. So I make, that dis I make that distinction. That's right. Uh, I don't know what's coming next for me in terms of art, but I feel internally something bigger, something bigger is coming. 
uh, which probably means something that's going to ruffle some Muslims' feathers, nice. you know, Inshallah. Uh, something that's going to push the envelope, uh, yeah, yeah. push the envelope a little bit. But I feel like now I'm at the point in my career, you know, I've been doing this, you know, 15 years now. I feel like I'm at the point in the career where I can start. Yeah, where I can I can start to be a filmmaker now. Like I feel like the other things I've done, people have liked some of it. You know, it's it's not stuff that's going to win at Sundance, or it's not people in Hollywood aren't calling me, begging me to direct their films. I feel like now I've got enough experience where I can start to tell those that's stories. Right. I'm a bit older now; I'm 41. You know, so I have a little bit more life experience to put into the to put into the films. So I feel like something's coming. I'm not sure if it's going to be a film about Islam or even Islamically themed, but I feel there's something brewing, and I can I can feel it. And hopefully, inshallah, it's going to come out soon. Inshallah. And there's our conversation with Mustafa Davis. As you can tell from where we left it, there's obviously a lot more that he has to say. So all that means is that we're absolutely going to have him back on. You can count on that, inshallah. But that wraps up this episode of the Diffuse Congruence podcast. And again, I want to offer my apologies for kind of a a helter-skelter release schedule. But I assure you, we're going to do everything we can to get back on track. And on behalf of... Parvez and myself, I want to thank you once again for taking the time to listen to the show, for sending in your comments, for everything you're doing to let us know how we're doing, because this show is about your reactions to it, so we want to make sure it is getting the best reaction possible. That being said, please do hit us up on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. The show is also available via Stitcher Radio and also via iTunes. Please write us a review. Let us know how we're doing. You can also send emails to diffusecongruence at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you, and hopefully you will look forward to hearing from us when we are back with our next episode very shortly, inshallah. And uh, again, let me say on behalf of Pervez, Ramadan Mubarak, and Eid Mubarak, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm. <laughs>